好，大家好。那我们接下来下一场议程即将开始。那接下来下一场这一场是 Taming the Chaos of Supply Chain Security Risk with Mitre's System of Trust。那近几年来说的话，我们在呃软体的这种 supply chain 跟硬体的 supply chain 上面都常常遇到很多攻击。例如说，像软体的话，过近几年就有像之前在 NPM 上面，呃，有一些新版的时候，他们在这个新的新版 library 里面插入一些呃恶意的程式码。那也有一些像这种这个。呃，在这个 supply 就是在运输运输过程中，呃，伺服器被安插了一些晶片等等的这种各种呃 supply chain 的问题。那这一场的话，我们这个讲者就给我们带来一些呃新的面对这种攻击的方式。呃、the next session is taming the、uh, chaos of supply chain security risk with Mitre's system of trust、um, by、um, Robert Martin.、Um, so in the past, we have seen many、um, supply chain issues. For instance, in the past, there was、um, authors inserting malicious code in NPM packages, or、um, in terms of physical security, there are servers、uh, that was、um, embedded with malicious chips、um, on the way. So uh, uh, the speaker will introduce、uh, new、um, methods or systems to do, to tackle this sort of problem. So、um, let's welcome、um, Robert、uh, Martin with an applause. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about MITRE's system of trust, which is aimed at helping with the broad problem of supply chain security.、Uh, I hope to give you a good understanding of what motivated it and what we're trying to do with it.、Uh, my name is Robert Martin. I go by Bob. But、um, you may know some of my work. I helped with the common vulnerabilities and exposures, the CVE effort,、uh, which we might have launched 22 years ago, and then about 18 years ago, we created、uh, the common weakness enumeration、uh, to list the weaknesses in software that lead to vulnerabilities. So, just as a、um, kind of level setting, so we're all、um, together here on、um, what I'm going to be talking about. When we think about supply chains, they basically bring、uh, harvested materials and created materials and bring them together into intermediate goods. That then follow some pattern and get created into goods that then are distributed and and end up in the end user's hands, and then often there's a disposal step. Now the reason supply chains are hard is because they're international. Very few supply chains happen locally. And this is because one,、uh, the very economical、uh, rates that sea transportation have taken over the last couple of decades, and that does not seem to be changing. So、uh, we can expect that、uh, supply chains are going to be global、um, for time going forward. So that general pattern of taking materials, following a design, going through some type of production and then distribution process to a customer, fits many different kinds of supply chains. Whether it's talking about seafood and the fish supply chain,、uh, where you're harvesting, landing, distributing. And then providing to the consumer, or microelectronics or chips, where you're using tools to build、um, masks that then get created in fabs, and then packaged and provisioned and put into all kinds of devices, or you're talking about software, where you're assembling packages and frameworks and components. You're putting them into some build process, test, package, and release. So it really doesn't matter whether you're doing fish 
chips or software. Supply chain has many of the same activities and processes and risks. The other thing that's changed over the last 15 years is that we've gone from where computers were an IT thing in companies to now we have software enabled automation in almost every aspect of our life. At the same time that was happening, we went from building software as a bespoke, a separate thing where you wrote pretty much all of it, except for maybe the drivers to talk to the hardware, to now it's basically an assembly where you're using other people's work to bring it together to actually produce the capability you're looking at. So when you combine those two things together, now when something goes wrong in software, it could end up harming property or lives. So the consequences of mistakes in software or attacks against software have dramatically shifted in the last 10 years. And this uh, is just a depiction of many of the industries that have really adopted software enabled automation and you know have very much benefited from that capability and often haven't realized the responsibility in safety and security that they're taking on by using software and automation. So when people talk about supply chains, often they focus on attacks and intentional uh, misbehaviors, you know, and things that they need to protect against. And I will offer that it also needs to be balanced with a look at the unintentional acts, poor quality, vulnerable software, which are can take your systems down and cause harm to your organizations as easily as intentional acts, or maybe more easily. So what are supply chain risks that you need to manage? There's many different perspectives, whether it's services that you've outsourced or you're trying to understand how to acquire goods that can be trustworthy and dependable, or you're worried about counterfeits, or you have some high value item that you're trying to purchase and you're worried about the ICT and software in it, or you're just worried about the supplier and whether they're gonna be around or your data or their data, or you're just trying to make a make buy decision. All of these end up having different concerns and uh, we end up thinking about the risks differently. And so we spend a lot of time trying to understand each other as buyers and sellers, as providers and consumers, you know, talk about uh, supply chain and supply chain risks. So we have noticed that when it comes to the question of what are supply chain risks, what am I gonna manage? That people either start with a blank sheet of paper or a whiteboard and start writing down a list of things that occur to them they may have experienced firsthand or heard about, or they say, well, the project over there seems to have a good handle on this. Let's borrow what they have. Both of these have problems. One, when you do a blank sheet of paper, the words you use, the way you think about the problem may be totally different than anyone else. And so you're gonna have a hard time communicating and understanding and leveraging other people's efforts and work. And on the when you borrow from another project, they may have a totally different sense of risk and risk aversion. They may have different consequences to failure 
and their technology and personnel mix may be totally different. And so you end up having to do a lot of adjustments. Um, so this is kind of the landscape. Now, third-party risk management is a part of this, but many people don't understand the very detailed set of risks that third-party risk management entail. Also, they don't think about attackers and counterfeits. They may not understand all the different kinds of natural disasters and hazards. I think most of us were surprised by the impact of the COVID virus on our world economy. Also, you know, human hazards where um, either in, you know, um, national corruption or civil disruption or corporate corruption can impact your supply chain. So what I'm offering, we call our supply chain security system of trust. And it's basically a starting point and a vocabulary of what supply chain risks you may need to pay attention to. And what we've done is we've been collecting from every source we can find any mention of a supply chain risk and putting it together and organizing it. Now, if we just do that, we'll have a huge list of risks that no organization could actually use. So the other part of system of trust is a method for profiling or down selecting very quickly to a subset that actually you can evaluate and do your business with. So that's the premise of what I'm gonna be talking about. Now, what is the basis of trust? What are we talking about here? We basically look at it in three dimensions, uh, risks from the supplier, the supplies themselves and the services. And we basically come up with 14 top level risk areas that comprise the independent risks that you may need to assess and, and manage as you uh, work with suppliers and the items they supply you or the services they provide. Now, what are some examples? So external influence, uh, here are some of the things that often are considered to be external influence risks. Similarly, financial stability. I mean, if you pick a company to be your supplier, you don't want them to go out of business next quarter. You'd like them to be around and continue to provide you product that you selected them for. Similarly, if they have a good product, you wanna make sure that it continues to be uh, and fulfill what you need out of it. So there's a, a whole set of risks that can come from your the failure to follow good hygiene. So those are three examples. This picture here is showing you an overview. And I just showed you these parts at this top level. Um, and so there's more areas and I, uh, will offer you a place to go find out more about these, but it really goes deeper. So it's very, basically think of it as a mind map and where the center of the mind map is things that are common across all industries and out towards the edges are the risks that are specific to particular industries. For instance, counterfeits are something many industries worry about and have to deal with but how do you detect and manage counterfeits is very different if it's microelectronics or counterfeit software, counterfeit sushi or handbags. This knowledge we've put together a, a data model to knit together this um, hierarchy, this vocabulary, and it includes weighting so that you can score the risks and we've actually had to build a content management system so that we can do the second part of what I talked about, which is come down to a subset and do that actively and coherently. So we've been doing a lot of piloting of this 
And one of the things we saw was the need to also be able to pull the, that subset, that profile into a spreadsheet so that people can take it to a protected enclave and do the assessment. Because once you start actually putting answers to the risk questions, it can get very sensitive very quickly. So we've been doing several rounds of piloting these numbers there, 11, 3, 1, 6, 22, 12, and so on, are the number of organizations that we've piloted against. And we've also been looking at how to present this material, because once you get a lot of data, it's very easy to miss the important things. And so, you know, in the US, if you're trying to work for uh, the government, you have to fill out a security clearance. That's 18, 19 pages of questions. But if you answer, yes, I am a, a convicted felon, it's a showstopper, it's over. It doesn't matter what you've answered to the other 18 pages. So there are similar risks in different industries that if they occur, it, that's it. You need to know that, nothing else matters. And so we've been working how to fold that into our system of trust. So to kind of walk through, we have a data model. The data model is being used to build the system of trust content. The content is a hierarchy of the different kinds of risks that you may need to deal with for your supplier, supply and service providers. You come into it with a particular point of view um, and that lets you get a subset of the system of trust and then you assess against that subset. If you have a different point of view, you end up with a different part of the system of trust set of risks and you assess against that. So what is this assessment? Here I'm showing you um, 11 companies that we assessed uh, using what we called Pilot One, which is a profile looking at uh, financial issues, cybersecurity issues, and a couple others. I'll show you the details in a moment. It's basically five of the seven supplier risk areas. But I wanted to show you in the upper left, you can see in the middle, there's this little blue area. Whereas if you look in the bottom right, there's a much bigger blue area. And just think of that as the risk surface area. So there's a lot more risk going on in company 11 than any other of the companies. And it becomes very apparent when you look at it this way. But let's look at it a little closer. So if the way to read this chart is the mid axis, the external influences, you can see here it's plotted to zero. And what that means is we saw no information saying that risk is present be, um, from any of the subcategories. So if you look in the upper right, you can see what those different subcategories of external influence are for this um, profile. Whereas if you look at the other areas, there was something that was saying there was additional risk. Sometimes it was quite a bit of risk, sometimes it wasn't. But this just shows you, and this was one of our early assessments, um, that it's fairly straightforward to do this and very repeatable and very uh, straightforward to do over and over again. So in the tool that we built, the content manager, we call it the risk model manager. One of the things we've done on top of putting all these risks is we've started to catalog, well, where do you get the answer to these risk questions? Some of those questions can be answered from public and private data sources. So we've started to put those into the tool and then assign them to the risk questions that they can help you answer. And then when you actually go to do an assessment, they actually are offered up. So I know it's pretty small, but 
uh, these slides will be available. Um, you can see here's one way of assessing it, and then here's another way. And uh, we're also starting to put in some automated assessments, and some of these data sources are very well structured and can be automated. Another way of getting insight into these risks, and here I'm showing you the taxonomy again, is to look at third-party assessments. Now, one example of that is the Telecommunications Industry Association's Supply Chain Security 9001, which has about 96 different um, requirements. And if your uh, supplier has been certified against that by a third party, it means they've met all of these requirements. Well, many of these requirements actually speak to the risks in system of trust. And so we've been working with TIA to map those so that if you tell the system of trust system that yes, this was a TIA SCS 9001 certified company, then inside system of trust for the applicable risks, it'll say, well, that means that they've met the following requirements, which are relevant to this risk. And then you can use that as part of your assessment. So there's other sources of this kind of data um, the, in the control systems and automation world. Uh, ISA IEC 62443 is very, very common for certifying products and uh, cap company capabilities. And so we're going to work with them to map that, as well as ISO 2243 uh, from the open group, the trusted technology provider uh, certification, which looks at malicious taint and counterfeit. So this is just another insight you can bring that can uh, make your assessment quicker. So system of trust in general is trying to let us do side-by-side -side assessments and make sure that you can have consistency and bring this down to something that you don't have to be a supply chain expert to actually use. But I wanna turn the corner and now talk about the software supply chain now, many of you may be aware that uh, two years ago, company SolarWinds was attacked. And what happened was bad actors got onto their networks, looked around, understood how they worked, how their systems ran, and then they uh, adjusted the build system so that it actually inserted uh, malicious code into the build as it was creating the software. And what that re uh, resulted in was SolarWinds packaging up and signing Trojan software and sending it out to its customers. So 18,000 organizations received that uh, tainted software and some of them were subsequently visited by the bad actors. So. Um, in January of 2021, MITRE wrote a paper, the uh, reference is on the bottom of the screen here, about how that could have been avoided. Of course, one part was to secure the environment so people can't just wander around and learn what's, how you do business and what's going on and make changes to your build system. But another part of it was to introduce a software bill of material, but not only introduce it as something you do for your customer, but rather use it inside the software factory, inside your software development process, and have signing of each step by the actor who does that process. And then actually daisy chain those so that you have an understanding of what went from one stop to another, and then compare it to what was supposed to happen. 
Now, there was a project called Intoto in the Linux Foundation that lays out how to do this. But the general idea is one that I think makes a lot of sense. A lot of people have started working towards that. And I'm about to tell you about an, another way of doing that. But the idea here is you could then say, okay, I now know that what was supposed to happen did happen. The people, the processes, the tools that were supposed to be used were used, and therefore it's safe to release. And then some version of the SBOM can be shared with the consumer so they can use it to manage the software in operation in their own play. So part of the thing I just talked about is the software bill material. Now, I think a lot of people ha have a little bit of confusion about what is a software bill of materials, and that's because there's actually three kinds, and they're very related, but they are separate. So one I'm showing here is the source code or build software build materials. So it knows all about all the components that are being brought together, the tools that are being used, and um, you know, out comes out the end product. Then there's the software build material of that targeted image, which can be firmware, disk images, container images, package feeds, all kinds of different things. So you can have a software bill of material of that targeted image, and it relates to the build SBOM, but it's not the same. And then when you install and start operating software, you actually have that operational SBOM, which now reflects the uh, linking to the local dynamic libraries and the service interfaces available on a specific device. So these are all related. They're kind of different uh, life cycle points, but they, um, you should make sure when you're talking to people about SBOMs, which of these or how many of these you actually are interested in. So here in the US, we put together some guidance on you know, uh, what kind of um, standards or formats were out there that could be used to depict a software bill material in a standardized way. And the three that were talked about quite heavily is the Software Package Data Exchange, SPDX, which is captured in ISO standard, the OWASP Cyclone DX uh, format, uh, as well as SWID tags, another, which is also captured in a ISO standard. Myself uh, and several colleagues put together another standards effort out of the object management group and the consortium for information and software quality. And we were trying to meet these requirements. The, and these were the th use cases that we were thinking about. And basically this has been driving um, standards work and we ended up merging our work with the SPDX work because they started coming to the same architecture uh, going forward. Also, um, SWID tags really aren't gonna be able to um, capture the full um, software bill material as we go forward. Now, NTIA, National Telecommunications uh, Industries um, and Information Administration, as part of the US Department of Commerce, did a lot of the leadership and coordination in their work on software bills and material, very focused on end users and what do they need and those who provide end users with products. What I just talked to you about, the work in the object management group, was aimed at the tools that are provided to those who build software-based products. So um, basically the package managers, the development environments, 
build choreography and so on. So that was our target. And what we came up with, and it'll be coming out in a couple of months, um, is a core bill of material standard that actually can um, be a bill material of software or of hardware. And um, then you can have license information and other information. And that means you can not only be talking to those who care about software, but also hardware and systems. And we think that's a more balanced way of dealing with this because most people who are worried about their software are very worried about the environment and the actual devices as well as the software. Um, in the US, um, the, um, there's a task force that has started to put together what should a hardware bill materials be, and we're trying to work with them so that um, they can make use of the SPDX standard. And there's many other types of things that we're capturing, provenance, pedigree, uh, the build, profile, the defects. And so I encourage you to, if you're interested in software bills and material, you can come help us test what we've come up with over the last two and a half years. And then the NTIA work is actually shifted to our Department of Homeland Security's Cyber Security Infrastructure Security Agency. Um, the gentleman leading that, Alan Friedman, has had moved from NTIA to CISA. This is a real quick chart just showing you uh, the architecture of our software bill materials. And the only thing I want to show you is the top two thirds to the right is that core, how do you manage a bill material? And it's only the very bottom that has four objects that are unique to software. And so we believe you can put other objects there for hardware and for networks and so on. So I wanna go back to the software supply chain now. Um, you know, as you build software, there's, um, you know, a lot of different ways you can do it, but um, there's also a lot of ways that can be attacked and manipulated. And so uh, an effort called the Supply Chain Levels for Software Artifacts, SALSA, has been aiming to look at that set of attacks and come up with, well, what kinds of things can you do to mitigate or remove those attacks? And they've organized it into different levels so that you don't have to track down every single uh, combination, but you can say, hey, I, I want a SALSA level two um, capability from my provider because those are the attacks I'm worried about. And one of the interesting things they've done is, well, a lot of the things you do are going to be attestations about how the software was built or how it was tested or how it was compiled. And so they've come up with a way of capturing those attestations that allows us to start standardizing them so that we can actually have someone document what they did and somebody else can read that and understand it because we have a structured way of talking about these different kinds of attestations. Attestations come throughout the life cycle of software, whether it's analysis of the requirements, of the architecture, the code itself, or uh, the operational environment. So attestations about what was done and the results are all part of what you really need to understand about those who are providing you software and what was done to make sure it actually has no vulnerabilities, has no quality defects, is not going to expose your organization if you use it. So the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is a new working group that's being formed out of the IETF uh, called SKIT. It's a Supply Chain Integrity, Transparency, and Trust working group. And basically, it's a confidential ledger 
hardware root of trust based capability to register claims and be able to get a signed receipt for those so you know when they were made by whom. But it's also a permissioned ledger, so not everyone can get at it. And so here are the basically outline of the things we're trying to accomplish, and the links are there for you to go read. But let me just talk about how you would actually use it. So if we go back to that software development uh, process that I talked about before and that we saw in the early fish chips and software as well as in the um, solar winds attack, what if instead of an in toto, you know, kind of here's the roadmap and did you do everything, we actually have a skip ledger and we can have skip policies in there as well as evidence. And so the policies could be you cannot commit code until you have evidence of the that all the commits have been signed by the approved developers. And so they're approved developers, not just any developers. And so the next step after that, you know, you want source providence from, you know, got an acceptable list of where this uh, come from and so on. So if you start getting that evidence, then you can start moving down that process. And so the idea here is not that you wait until the end and compare to see if the things you expected were done, but actually you can gate this internally. And so the idea here is that this could be done inside the software development factory and the, inside the organization. So they have confidence and uh, they have backup data to tell their customers that there's a reason to have assurance or for an auditor, or if something goes wrong, for them to support an a, a investigation. But another way of looking at this is from the outside, from the market. So if my company has a policy that says software coming into our organization needs the following types of attestation uh, from the following types of attestors. So that's kind of a gating policy. So someone who creates software, the factor we just saw, they can actually uh, collect those different attestations as we just saw and put them into a external ledger and that I can then, when I try to get software, they can check to see if the right kinds of things were done and therefore I can now bring the software in. So this uh, architecture is available out in this RFC. Um, and then the countersigning of that evidence when you put it into the ledger is captured in this other RFC. But this isn't just for software. So if we go look at the fish uh, supply chain, you can say, well, there's certain things that you want to happen with the fish. You know, it needs to be kept cold, it needs to be to be fresh. It needs to have been caught in a certain number of days. So there's all these criteria, these gates. And then you can collect the evidence that lets you know you've actually met those criteria. And similar for microelectronics. You know, when you, you've got criteria against the, um, you know, um, EDA tools, the mask, the packaging, and so on. And so you can collect that evidence and use it to make sure that the right things are happening in that supply chain. So while the IETF effort is chartered to work on software first, we're doing it in a way that we don't block the ability to use this for any kind of supply chain in an organization. Because the bottom line of all of this is, you know, what when you manufacture goods and deliver goods, it's no longer just a flow from the, you know, creation to the use. There's this two-way street now about the quality, the pedigree, and re why should I have assurance? And so all of these things are focused on enabling that. 
So I'd like to leave the stage by talking, you know, telling you that we think that the questions about how do I assess supply chain risks, we think system of trust is a part of that. And also the SKIT and SBOMs are going to be part of that in the software area. We've been doing a lot of talking to different groups. Uh, I'll be ungraying uh, hacks in Taiwan conference in, uh, after tonight. And um, we've been doing a lot of engagement in the government as well to educate them. And we're going to be licensing this, making it available for free um, and doing education and training hopefully get a lot of people involved. So if you have ideas about supply chain security and like to get involved, please reach out to me. Um, it's sot at mitre.org. We've already got many organizations. This is just a snapshot of the kinds of organizations that we have involved already. Some of these we've signed NDAs some were in the process, and we're also going to have a, a working group so that we can do this in a more scalable way. But there's papers out there to talk about all these things I've talked about, and there's a website. And again, you can contact me through sot at mitre.org. With that, I thank you, and I'm ready for questions. Thank uh, you. Uh, we thank Robert for the um, fantastic uh, talk. So, um, is there any questions? Um, uh, okay, so there's a, there's a few questions from um, uh, some, some of our online audience. So, um, one of the questions is, uh, what's the difference between MITRE's system of trust and other supply chain security frameworks? So, for instance, C S uh, C dash uh, S C R M from an S T. So what we're trying to do is be comprehensive and consistent across the different domains. Most of the other frameworks have very focused area, uh, areas where they've been concentrating on. So they may do a good job in certain kind of products in certain industries but they don't reflect like cyber and software and, or they don't address pharma and food stuff as well as, you know, um, you know, goods and services. Um, so we're trying to bring these all together. And we think a lot of these other frameworks, like I was showing with the TIA SES 9001, if you follow those, you will have fulfilled a subset of what's in System of Trust. But by looking at this more broad look, you may see some things that you're not addressing. So I don't know if people are uh, familiar with MITRE's attack framework, where we help people think about how attackers behave when they get into your networks and the vocabulary for describing that. Think about uh, what we're doing as the equivalent of that for supply chain. We, we want to be able to give you that framework in which to make sure that you're addressing the things you need and you can bring the different solutions that are already out there together, um, but you know, in a more comprehensive way. Okay, so um, from my understanding of your um, answer to this question is that um, uh, so stuff like uh, CSCRM will provide you some information to work with uh, in the framework that, uh, of like system of trust. Um, so right. that way you will figure out like uh, you have the SCRM uh, and then what else you need, right? So, right. so that, okay, I see. Um, uh, maybe is there anyone who, uh, else who wants to ask a question? Um, um, if not, I think we can um, field another question um, from online, some of our on online audience. So, um, 
uh, one of the questions is, um, if a company want, wants to introduce some defense mechanisms of supply chain into our process, what's the first step? So there's like the system of trust. Um, so what, what do they do? Like if they want right. to buy some server, they want to implement, so they want to deploy some software, uh, what would be the first step? Right, so <clears throat> system of trust is showing you what the risks are, but when you go to assess those risks, you may uh, either find that there are mitigations in place or def defenses. So the idea is, you know, people who have solutions that can protect against some of these risks will be able to show, hey, my solution addresses system of trust risk 87, 92, 48. And, you know, so if those are of concern to you, I have something you can use to help manage that. So it gives them a way of telling their story about what their product and capability does without having to you know, write the story themselves. Okay, so um, if I understand correctly, um, so for like, if I wanna deploy certain service on my servers, um, I will use the system of trust as a checklist to see um, if there's stuff that um, I need to pay attention to. And then for the stuff that I need to pay attention to, then I should look for solutions in that space. Um, right. And the Rather solution than, is... Um, yeah. Because so what happens, is, uh, yeah, is I think, okay. every vendor will tell you, install my stuff, it will solve your problems. But what problems are you trying to get solved? Let's have a list of those and then figure out which technologies can actually address those risks. Um, because what often I find is a solution does help, but there's edges and gaps that are left unaddressed. And you need to bring more than one solution to bear, but you need that comprehensive view in order to understand how much was addressed by this tool, how much is addressed by this procedure, you know, and, and how they come together. Okay, I see. So um, in a way, the system of trust um, is a way for us to um, kind of look at the stuff we buy, um, like as a um, say service provider, like um, the stuff we buy, um, and if they cover all of the um, possible scenarios that we might need to deal with. Okay, right. I see. Cool. Um, so um, anyone from uh, on site wants to um, ask a question? Uh, hello, uh, Robert, and thank for your uh, interesting talk. Um, here I have awesome. a question because MITRE is always very fantastic for us because you always develop a useful and high-impact framework like the CWE or MITRE ATT and CK framework. So I would like to know when you design uh, in this time the supply chain of trust, uh, system, uh, system of trust, uh, what kind of experience that you can learn from the past when you develop the CWE and to develop the uh, MITRE AT and CK, what kind of experience you can learn from the past experience and to apply in this time? Well, since, since I'm the creator of CWE, uh, I have a lot of lessons and um, um, good experiences and bad about things to do and not do. But I think one of the biggest things is um, look for ways to get feedback make it easy for people to comment and offer corrections and point out missing areas or, you know, things to help evolve. And so one of the things we hope to get done this fall is actually we're going to have the comprehensive system of trust on our website, and we hope to have it in a way that people can come and just basically click and leave a comment. And so that we can more actively and dynamically get people's inputs and feedback about, you know, I need more understanding of this, or did you think about this subcategory of risk? So I think one of the things we've learned is, you know, there is a wealth of information out there 
that individuals have. Maybe they don't individually know everything, but they may know a missing piece. And so if we can make it easy for them to contribute, we're all collectively going to have a better CWE or system of trust. And uh, that, that's one of the things I've found is that people are very in, in interested in, you know, making use of it, but also there it's, you know, not perfect the day it was born. So we need to allow a way for that to evolve as a community effort. So um, look forward to people helping do that for a system of trust. Okay, um, thanks. Um, so um, I think there's one last question from online. So um, the, the question is, um, so are you aware of like any CI CD tools that kind of implement this um, system of trust um, or can be used for this purpose? Or do you expect so, that to be something that in, yeah, that's going to so, appear in the future? So because system of trust is so comprehensive, you know, there are tools out there that they're called, you know, vendor illumination or supply chain illumination tools that can do some of this. You know, they'll point out, um, you know, companies that may be in financial hardship or that are in, you know, flood prone areas. So there's going to be pieces of this. Um, there's also, you know, when you look at products, your traditional software quality, software testing tools, security testing tools, they can collect some of this information. But this is a big tree to hang that kind of information on to give you that overarching understanding of your risks. Um, I see. Um, thanks. So um, due to time constraint, um, we'll probably end, end here. And um, to contact you, they can uh, use the email, right? SOT at uh, MITRE. Um, right. uh, .org. Cool. Um, and the slides will be available, right? Uh, yeah, I believe I offered the PDF to the organizers. So. OK. Um, cool. So um, we'll end the session here. And let's um, uh, thank uh, Robert with another round of applause. Thank you. Take care. Um, thank you.